It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the film from November 28th, 1997. Well, uh, technically November 26th, because we were at Thanksgiving weekend in 1997, so most of the new releases are going to open up on the Wednesday before instead of Friday. So we have four movies to look at, but uh, let's go ahead and jump right into those movies, and we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and that is Robin Williams in the remake of The Absent-Minded Professor, a.k.a. Flubber. I hope you people out there found that amusing, because that is the entire movie. Loud noises, comedy that's not really all that funny or clever, and characters that you really, really do not like. Like, it takes a lot to hate a character played by Robin Williams. Robin Williams is a terrific actor, he's made a lot of great movies, but he's also made his fair share of terrible movies. This is definitely one of his worst ones, because he plays a character that you're supposed to root for, you're supposed to get behind, but I'm sorry, this guy... This guy is just such an obnoxious, obnoxious character. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't want to marry his fiance. He's missed two weddings. He misses a third one in this movie. And and like everybody in this movie is just so stupid because the the girl the fiance in this movie played Mar Marsha Gay Harden, like any normal person, if your if your husband to be misses your wedding not once, not twice, but three times, you call it off at that point, but not in this movie. No, 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 no. If we did that, we wouldn't have a movie. And oh, and by the way, he doesn't. It's even after all this is said and done, he still misses the wedding at the end of the movie. So that's four times in this movie that this guy misses this wedding for no, is. And by the end of it, we're just supposed to accept it. It's just like no, this doesn't work in real life. And I, I know this isn't supposed to be real life, but still, like. You don't tr You don't like anybody in this movie whatsoever. Robin Williams' character is obnoxious. Marsha Gay Harton's character is supposed to be this uh, dean, of, this president of the college, and she's stupid because she still sticks around with this guy. Everybody else in this movie is just stupid. Like the is like there's these different subplots going on here that make no sense whatsoever. Like one of the kids that from uh, from this professor's class, Robin Williams' class, gets a bad grade, and you know what? And they just. Is and the dad of this kid, the kid played by Will Wheaton, basically says, "You know what? You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna send my go goons out to them to give them a better grade because why not? I mean, why not do that? I mean, just like, it's just like it's, it's just, it's so stupid. Like that doesn't make any sense. The subplot about um, Weibo, played by Jody Benson, who honestly is one of the best things about the movie and also kind of the worst things about it because." The performance starts off fine, and then for no reason, in the second half of the movie, there's another subplot that comes in where Weebo kind of wants to have sex with with the professor, even though she's a robot, and creates this hologram of herself, which is supposed to be Jodie Benson. And it's just like, like, I get what you're trying to do, and you get you're trying to make this like a magical, whimsical moment in here, but no. If I see a ghost of a of a woman walking up to me while I'm lying in bed, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, and I'm and I'm doing everything I can to get the hell away from you. Like, you might think that's charming, but no, it's not. It's really not. And everything about this movie is so just wrong. The humor in this movie is not funny. The jokes in this film are not funny. There's a whole sub there's another subplot where. Uh, Robin Williams' character uses the flubber to help this basketball team, and they're like they're, they're supposed to be the nerdy basket the the underdog basketball team because they're all nerdy and they all have glasses. That every single one of them has glasses. Even the coach has glasses. It's just like, what's the point? Like, what's the point of this whole thi thing? It's just like this whole movie makes no sense. The only real character you like throughout the course of the movie is, is Christopher McDonald playing the bad guy. And you know why you like him? Because he straight out tells you everything about his character. He's basically just like, it's the first moment he comes on screen. It's the first moment he comes on screen the and meets and meets Professor Brainer. He he basically says, "I'm back to is I'm back to basically steal your steal your soon to be wife from you." Like he literally says that, and Robin Williams says it's funny, but no, like that performance he gives is just like no, he's serious, and it's just like I could hate the guy, but you know what? He's the most sensible guy in the entire movie because he's basically telling you everything you need to know about his character. And you know what? He was still the funniest character in the entire movie. He's the one character that you actually get behind, like. The visuals in this movie are abysmal. The whole movie is nothing but loud noises, this really over-the-top CGI that just looks terrible by today's standards. And even back in 1997, it would look horrible as well. Like, it's just... 
it kind of goes back to what we've been talking about with most of these live-action Disney movies in 1997. They're, most of them were pretty bad, with the lone exception being George of the Jungle. And the sad part about it is, it just keeps going from there, because we get at least three more years of this. Like, whoever was running the live-action department at the at Walt Disney Pictures, like, they should have gotten their ass fired years ago, years before this, because we're not even scratching the surface of all the bad movie, the live action, bad live action films the studio has done in those three years. Like, but this is the most obnoxious. It's the most absurd. It's the most ridiculous. It's the most stupid. It wastes way too many talented people. This is directed by Les Mayfield, who made Miracle on 34th Street, which is a great underrated remake written by John Hughes. And speaking of John Hughes, guess what? He's the writer of this movie. Like, he put he'll put an alias to his name on stuff like Beethoven or Made in Manhattan, but he's proud of this. He's so proud of this. Not to mention he's also proud of the next movie that comes out the following month, but I digress. Flubber is just a mess. We can talk about how bad this is on so many other levels, but we gotta move along here. So, yeah, it's a terrible movie. Avoid it like the plague. So, uh, and needless to say, it doesn't get any better from there because our next movie is the fourth installment of the Alien series, Sigourney Weaver and Winona Ryder, in Alien Resurrection. Just because we needed to stop t having people compare, say Alien 3 is the worst of the Alien series, here's this movie, Alien Resurrection, given to us by the director that gave us Delicatessen, written by Joss Whedon, right as, right as he was beginning to make his name with Buffy the Vampire's Lay of the TV series. And uh, Ellen Ripley's back again, this time she's a clone, and an alien queen is surgically removed from her body, and it completely takes away the character that we've come to know and love from the last couple of movies and turns her into this bizarre, heavily sexually, horn, he heavily horny Ellen Ripley, who's just like, everybody she talks to in this movie, she like wants to have sex with. Like, it's really, it's really uncomfortable to, is to see her in these, in this movie, because she's not really making any sense with anybody involved in here, and it would help if the movie had some kind of clarity or any idea of what it was trying to do, but it's just the same movie over again. It's the same movie we've seen done over and over again, and it's like they're trying to make it because Alien 3 got such a bad rap, and they thought that, okay, maybe it's time to delve into something new and unique with it, and there ain't nothing new and unique with it. This is still the same movie that we've seen done over and over again. It's been there, done that. There's characters that are introduced that you do not give a crap about whatsoever, and... There's just no rewatchability to it whatsoever. Like, once Aliens ended, that shouldn't have been it. Alien 3, like, even Alien 3, I'd give a pass to because it was trying to do something with a new, with a first-time director and David Fincher, but it didn't quite work as much as they wanted it to. But even in Alien 3, there's still stuff in there you can look at and go, I can definitely see where you're coming from here. There is nothing good about this movie whatsoever. It is so boring and so bland and so mediocre and I know it's not the people involved in this fault. I know it's not the director's fault. The director's fault is because the director later would go on to make great films again, like Amelie and A Very Long Engagement and Mick Max and Josh Whedon. We saw what we've seen what his success has eventually come to after this. But so I really don't know who to blame for this. Like, who's the person I should blame for this? But like the studio maybe because they kept, did the, if because it just doesn't make any sense, like, why this, they felt like this was the best thing they could do after Alien 3. Like, what was the point of this? What was supposed to be the purpose for this? And it just doesn't work. Like, you don't care about any of these new characters because you know they're going to die anyway. From, there's, there, most of them, 90% of them are going to get killed by this alien creature. And there's nothing that clever about it. There's nothing unique about it. The visuals are probably the best thing about it, but again... Alien 3 had pr better practical and visual effects in that movie, and at least that one had an ending to it, to that to that series. This just feels like a tacked-on movie, like like you know how people right now are going are going after Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny as a pointless sequel that's not that great. Even though if you actually see the movie, it's actually nowhere near as bad as it should be. This is the movie that everyone thinks Al Indiana Jones is, except this is actually what it. Is is for the Alien movies. After this, there was no need to make another movie out of it because they have not done anything of note, with the exception of Prometheus, but even then, that was just barely pushing it. And, um, I don't know. Like, this movie just... This was... This should have been... The, this should have been the final nail in the coffin for the Alien series. I know they tried to do it with, again with Prometheus, which wasn't... 
terrible, but it still wasn't a great film. I mean, that was a mo Prometheus was a movie that was felt like it was way too self congratulatory about itself before the movie even came out. Uh, the Alien vs. Predator movies are not that great either. Alien Covenant's a piece of shit. Uh, here's hoping this new Alien movie that's coming out next year actually turns out good in this new Alien series they've got working on for FX right now. Here's hoping that turns turns the series around again. But honestly, you could have stopped at Alien Three, and I don't think anybody really would have been that upset about it. At least in my opinion, it wouldn't have been like that. it would have been like that. So anyway, that's Alien Resurrection. So let's go ahead and move on to the next movie we have here: Clive Owen and Mick Jagger in Bent. So the story is basically you, it revolves around the persecution of homosexuals in Nazi Germany after the murder of the the SA leader Ernst Röhm on the night of the Long Knives. It's a British Japanese film directed by Sean Mathias, written by uh, Martin Sherman. Which, hey, who would have guessed that Jay Sherman's son actually would have grown up to become a writer? Actually, that's not true whatsoever. But that's the first thing I thought about it was the critic and the uh, you know M Martin Sherman, that uh, Jay Sherman's son. But uh, this actually was written back in 1979, and um, one of Clive Owen's early films, and I had no idea Mick Jagger was also in here as well. You also have um, Ian McKellen, Nicolaj Costa-Waldo Costa from Game of Thrones is in here too, so is Jude Law, Paul Bettany, Rachel Weisz. Anyway, before I was so rudely interrupted, I don't know what happened there, but like I said, Jude Law, Paul Bettany, Rachel Weisz, they were also in this movie as well. Um... I don't know. I mean, it looks pretty. It looks like a visually stunning-looking film, but I've never seen the movie before, so I don't really know if it's any good or not, but um, it could be good. Also, Philip Glass does some music for this, too, which is very interesting. I didn't think it is. I didn't think he did that many musical scores of note here, but I know he did this, and I know he also did Fantastic Four, which two very different films in quality, more than likely, but, um, but I digress. Uh, this film, I don't know too much about it. Could be good. As an interesting idea to it, early is a chance to see some early works by Owen, Jag, uh, Law, Bettany, and Rachel Weiss. So, could be something interesting, but I don't know for sure. But um, anyway, let's go ahead and move on to the last film we have here, and that is Welcome to Cerevero. So the story for this centers around uh, Stephen Delane and Woody Harrelson, American and British journalists who come together along with their respective news teams. They meet at the beginning of the Bosnian War in Sarajevo, Sarajevo, I think I'm pronouncing that right, and during the reports the group find this orphanage run by the devoted Mrs. Savick, played by Marissa Tomei. Is it? Is, no, it's not Marissa Tomei. I, I've never seen this movie, so I don't know for certain, but um, they find this woman near the front line and feeling sympathy... Um, they decide to take one of the children back to England illegally, and it creates and chaos ensues eventually. But um, yeah, as you can tell, I have not seen this movie before, so I have no idea if this is any good or not. But um, directed by Michael Winterbottom, who later went on to give us stuff like Twenty Four Hour Party People, A Mighty Heart, um, The Road to Guantanamo, A Cock and Bull Story, uh, The Emperor's New Clothes, some decent some decent little films here and there. Um, good cast. Woody Harrelson, Marissa Tomei, Goran Viznik from ER. Uh, strong cast overall in here, so there's definitely a lot of potential here for something really good. But, um, I don't know. It's not something I haven't seen, so I don't really know too much about it. But, um, my interest has peaked, though, so maybe one day I might check it out. But, um, anyway, that is Welcome to Sarajevo. And so that wraps up another edition of Time About the Movies, and we're heading into the last month of 1997 already. Next time around, we'll take a look at two movies, including Robin Williams' big return to form after the infamous flubber, and that is Good Will Hunting, also the movie that introduced the world to Ben Affleck and Matt Damon as pretty good screenwriters, as well as Gus Van Sant's film that eventually got him some award attention. And we also have The Ride, so two movies to look at next time around, and uh, we'll delve into those in the next episode. But until then... Uh, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, uh, please hit the place on the next page, check out the previous episode, and I will see you guys tomorrow for another episode. Oh, and uh, I almost forgot to mention, uh, hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So, until tomorrow, I will see you then. Until then, take care.